All right. So the subject for tonight, obviously, we're reading from the last chapter of Leviticus. This is one of those chapters that many people find it very difficult to, to read through sometimes. You're just like, what is all this talking about? Why do I care about the estimation and the value and it's good or it's bad and everything else? But the Bible says that you know, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us even today. Like in the New Testament, the New Testament says that it's profitable for, for instruction and, and um, doctrine. And what we're going to be studying tonight is the doctrine of the tithe. Now, I don't preach on giving and tithing and things like that very frequently. Anyone who's followed along at all with, with my ministry and, and my preaching over the past four and a half years will know that. That's not some big focus. You know, there's, there's a lot of churches out there where it's like they're hitting on tithing like every week and it's just like this, this week after week after week they just keep on drilling this topic of money. I don't like to do that. I don't think we need to do that. I don't think there's a, you know, a purpose for doing it every week unless you've got other problems in the church. I think that's just indicative of other problems of just getting people involved in general and getting their heart into a church. I'm not preaching this sermon because I think that there's an issue at all. So if, if I say anything tonight and you're like, oh man, he's preaching to me, I have no idea. Okay? <laughs> like, I had nobody in mind on a sermon like this at all. I don't, you know, I record what we receive in. We do everything above board. But other than that, you know, we're not like the Mormon church who's like asking you to sign like an affidavit that like this, is, you know, I'm tithing to the church and they've got all their paperwork and all that stuff. You know, that's, uh, that's pretty crazy. And I know there's churches out there that do that type of a thing, but that's not how we do things here. The tithe is between, first of all, it's between you and God. Okay. It doesn't matter personally to me what you do with your money, that's going to be between you and God. But I do believe in the doctrine of tithing. I do believe it's biblical. And I do believe that the subject needs to be preached on periodically because it's an important doctrine. If someone's going to try to say that I'm greedy and I'm all about the money from preaching this sermon, then so be it. Because I'll tell you this much, I'm not going to leave anything unpreached that's in the Bible. And since this is in Scripture, I'm going to preach on it. Now, I don't see this in Scripture, like in every single book of the Bible, just repeated all the time, so we're not going to be preaching it all the time. Right? I try my best to preach on subjects that, hey, if I see something more frequently in Scripture, then it's probably more important and I'm going to hit on that more, more often. But everything in the Bible deserves some preaching, because otherwise, why is it there? Now, this topic, though, th this isn't just some little thing either. There actually is a lot. I have, and, and you know, I promise I'm going to do my best to get out of here. I'm probably going to skip over a lot of this, but I was trimming down and trimming down and trimming down the amount of Scripture there is regarding this topic. There is a lot. It, there's a lot. There's, I could split this up into multiple sermons. I just don't want to. I want to try to get as much as I can just in one sermon because... I don't think it's, it's just that necessary to, to kind of drive it in week after week after week and just get it in in one sermon. But there is a lot of scripture on this. Now, we're going to go over a little bit some of the Old Testament tithing in the Levitical priesthood and how it was done there. And then we're going to apply it to the New Testament because the, the biggest attack, I think, these days is that people will say, well, tithing, that's just something from the Old Testament and in the New Testament that's changed, it's done away with, and I'm going to show you that that's not the case, that it actually was never changed. And what we believe in this church, when it comes to anything, any doctrine, and when it comes to just understanding the Bible, is that whatever we read in the Old Testament Unless we can see that it was specifically changed in the New Testament, it all stands. It's all still good. It doesn't need to be reiterated. Every single commandment and every single thing in the Old Testament doesn't have to be repeated in the New Testament in order for us to believe that it still stands. Were there some changes made between the two? Of course there were. That's evident. 
We're not doing sacrifices anymore. There's a, the Levitical priesthood was changed. So all the carnal ordinances and washings and things like that that we read about in Scripture, we don't do that anymore. But that has all been spelled out for us as well in the New Testament that we don't have to do those things. We don't observe that. It's very clear. Now, one of the things that was not specifically mentioned in the New Testament that's done away with is the tithe. So we're going to go into that. We're going to look at, and when you understand the purpose of the tithe, when you understand how they did it, who it was for, why it was even instituted, it's going to make perfect sense why it still works today, why it's still applicable in the New Testament. So let's dig into this a little bit and try to stay with me. First of all, what we need to understand, because people who, can, who like to confuse this issue one of the biggest things they'll do is confuse the different types of giving that there is in the scripture. They'll take verses talking about a completely different type of giving and try to apply that to a tithe. A tithe is one aspect of giving and one aspect of the law. The word tithe literally means a tenth. And we're going to look at that here in scripture, but there are free will offerings there is, there is um, offerings given for other saints. There's offerings given to support ministries, missionaries, evangelism. There's all different reasons that money can be collected or given. And it's not all just called the same thing. There's alms that you can give. These are all different terms, different ways to give financially or otherwise, just to give of yourself or to make a sacrifice. It's not all just a tithe. So keep that in mind as we read the passages. And I'm going to point out some of the distinctions between them as we go. But we're in Leviticus 27. I'm going to just read for you real quick from Nehemiah 12, 44, because this illustrates a little bit what I'm talking about. You don't have to turn there, but Nehemiah 12, 44 says, And at that time were some appointed over the chambers for the treasures. So they're appointing people for the treasury to, to bring in what everybody's giving. It says for the offerings... For the first fruits and for the tithes to gather into them out of the fields of the cities of the portions of the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced for the priests and for the Levites that waited. So right there alone in that one verse, it's saying they appointed people to take care of the offerings, the first fruits and the tithes. All different things that people were giving for. So, of course, as I mentioned, a tithe, what is a tithe? Tithe is just a different word for a tenth. It's just an old word. It, just, it literally just means a tenth. So if you don't want to call it a tithe, you can call it a tenth. Same thing. Now, in this passage in Leviticus 27, it doesn't get an, into tithing until the very end. And the reason is because it's, it's demonstrating a point here. So it starts off with somebody dedicating things to the Lord whether it be themselves or whether it be like their house or a portion of their house or something of their goods or one of their animals or whatever, they want to give something to the Lord. They want to dedicate something to the Lord. And it's just giving you a way to deal with this stuff, to have it valued, and also then to be able to, if that person wants to redeem it, it means they want to like take it back. They say, you know what? I'm going to dedicate my house unto the Lord. Or I'm going to dedicate my, my oxen for the service of the Lord, for the Levites, for the priests. You know, I'm going to dedicate this. It's still mine, but I'm going to dedicate it to the Lord. And then you say, you know what? No, I actually need that back. I'm going to use that. So I'm going to redeem that and I'm going to get it back. And it wasn't a sin, but in order to do that, then what they would prescribe is that, well, you're going to give the fifth part of the value then back to them. So you're, you're basically giving, you know, like 20% more but, you know, above to be able to redeem that back and to get that back. Now, in this chapter, you know, it's, it's bringing up all this other stuff, but the point of that is because when you dedicate something, it's, it's, it's holy, it's set apart for the Lord. And then it gets into the tithe in order to demonstrate that the tithe is the Lord's. Like, that is, that's what belongs unto the Lord. It's His. Now, it gives you an opportunity to redeem that tithe if you want to but you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost even more to do so. And, you're gonna, and, and you can do it. You say, well, no, right now I really need that money or whatever, and I want to redeem that tithe. 
Well, then when you give back, you have to give 20% above on top of that, like of the actual tithe itself, if that makes sense. You add a fifth part of whatever it is that you're redeeming back to it when you pay it back. Now, um, look at verse number 30. Well, let's reread this, this last portion of Scripture here. The Bible says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. So right there, just saying, look, that belongs to God. And if a man will at all redeem out of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. Now, again, this is talking about like, you know, a tithe doesn't have to be money. We think of it as money today because that's our economy. We're in, we're in a money-based economy. The economy back then was more agrarian, more agricultural. So, you know, it's not that money didn't exist. Money did exist. But you'd have a lot more uh, commerce being done with food and with animals and things like that. And it was an easy way to trade and to do business and things like that. So if you have someone, you got, if you have a farm, you, you do uh, husbandry, you have animals or whatever, you have oxen, then basically what God's saying here is that however much increase you have each year, you have, you know, 10 calves. Well, one of those calves belongs unto the Lord. God's blessed you. He's, he's multiplied the number of calves that you have because that's going to bring you forth even more prosperity. It's going to help you out that much more. He's basically blessed you with that increase. Then he's just saying, well, God owns one-tenth of whatever. So whatever it is, it, it could be it could be the calves, it could be the, you know, the food that you're bringing, whatever it is that you're doing that's, that's causing you to increase, that's all it is. It's not, the tithe applies to any of that stuff. And it's not, it's not only like the fruit of the ground or fruit from a tree. It's not like, it's, it's not only agriculture, it's not only animals, it's all of these things. It's just giving you these examples because that's the most common. That's what people did for their, for their livelihood. And it's saying here that that belongs to God. And what it says is the tenth. And God's not saying you have to give him only like all of the best. But he's also saying don't give him all of the worst either. So if you have, you know, your animals produce. And you have, you know, a bunch of them that came out with, with imperfections. And they're not going to be very good for you. They're not going to be very good work animals or whatever. You can't be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to give all these to God right? But he's not requiring you to go through them and pick out and cherry pick the best ones either. He's just saying, just give me the 10th. Just one, two, three, you know, you count to 10, one for the Lord. You count to 10, one for the Lord. You know, you could just do it that way and there you go and they're done. And that's what God's saying is that just, just give him the 10th. Basically, it's just use common sense and be fair about it, Right? Because it belongs to God. And that's, that's the biggest point, I think, that we need to realize. It's, it's God. God's the one who gives us the increase. God's the one who's blessing you. It belongs to him. We can't think about this stuff, even though it's in your possession physically, as, as it being yours. Um, turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 18. Now, that being said, there's a few topics that come up and questions that come up when it comes to tithing in general that I hear and I've seen from people. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's a few things that, that people do and people have done, whether it be in this church or in other churches. And I think it's great. And I think it's really nice. And I think well, there's a lot of people here who are very generous, very generous. And I know a lot of people love God and that everyone here, I honestly believe everyone here just wants to do what's right. And I do too. I want to do what's right. Um, which is why I'm preaching on this. I'm preaching on this so that we could all have a, a knowledge and information. But I do think that, I think that sometimes people might feel obligated to give even more than God requires. One of the, the, the ways, one of the things I mean by that is like, um, you know, I've heard people even preach on this, not anyone in our movement, but like, where some preachers talk about going and do back tithing. 
where they go back like however many years to times where they were like making money or something and going back and then and then paying all of that to God. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do or to sin or there's anything wrong with doing that. I honestly personally don't think that that's necessary. I don't think God's requiring us to go back and do all of that, especially if it's if, you know, you were living ignorantly, even if you were saved or whatever, to then go back and just like, you know, just like, well, I owe, you know, all of this money now. And I'm just going to have to give all of that to God. I don't think that God requires that of us. I think that the, the purpose of it and the spirit of this is just to rely on God and to give him the 10% that belongs to him. And that's it. He's not asking for anything more. I think he just wants you to be obedient with that. That's my belief on that. Now, if you want to go back and do that, I mean, hey, God bless you. And maybe God will bless you for that, you know, just, just for doing something and giving above and beyond. But I'm just trying to teach what I think that the Bible is teaching. And I don't think that that's something that's just, you have to go back and do this. Otherwise, you're not right with God. I don't believe that. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. Numbers 18, look at verse number 26. This is going to give us a little bit more of an insight into the why. Why is there a tithe? What is the purpose of it? Obviously, we've seen that it belongs to God. It's God's. He deserves it, so we shouldn't withhold it from him. Look at verse number 26. The Bible says, Thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. Thus ye also shall offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel. And ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord, of all the best thereof, even the hallowed part thereof out of it. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, When ye have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the winepress. And ye shall eat it in every place, ye and your households, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. And ye shall bear no sin by reason of it when ye have heaved from it the best of it. Neither shall ye pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, lest ye die. So we see here in, in Numbers 18 that not only does, do the re, in, in this case, the rest of the tribes of the children of Israel have to give a tithe because they give the tithe to support the Levites. Levi, the tribe of Levi, was taken apart from the other 11 tribes in order to do the service of the Lord. So while all the other tribes were given an inheritance in the promised land, they're given land, they're given, you know, everything to build on and to, to do their business and everything else. The Levites, God said, nope, I want this group of people to work in the tabernacle. They're going to be doing the offerings. They're going to be working for me full time. And since they're working for God full time, they don't have time to go and work in the field and do everything else and, and, and earn an income and earn a living because they're serving the Lord. Well, since they're serving the Lord, they need to be taken care of. So God instituted the tithe in order to do that. But just because he instituted a tithe to help them out, he says, well, you know what? You guys still have to pay a tithe. Whatever's coming in unto you that you're receiving, that you're collecting, he's saying, you're going to treat that just as if you had gone out and you brought that in from the fields yourself and that, you know, God bless you in that way. You're also giving a tithe of that, that everybody is participating in this. Why? Because there's more to it than just, you know, like God needing money. God doesn't need your money. He really doesn't. God could, God could do whatever he wants. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, right? God owns the whole world. He doesn't need your money. But there's a lot of things that he teaches us also with the tithe. And I think the biggest thing is just to rely on him. Turn if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 
Deuteronomy 18 is basically going to explain what I just said without giving you a scriptural reference for it. Deuteronomy 18, verse number 1, the Bible says, The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he hath said unto them. And this shall be the priests due from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep, and they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw, the first fruit also of thy corn and of thy wine and of thine oil, and the first of the fleece of thy sheep shalt thou give him. For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. So it just explains why, you know, why God's doing this. And also that it's the first fruits are in the tithe of everything. And that makes sense too, because whatever is being produced, whatever is being blessed with, you know, it's not going to be like just corn. Because then that means they're going to be living on like just corn forever. You know, I mean, that's all they're going to have. It's, it's the animals, it's the food, you know, it's the clothing, they're going to get the wool, whatever. All the stuff that you would normally benefit from and that you would get, it's the whole rest of the group, the whole rest of the nation is taking care of one tribe. So they're, they're giving of everything in order to, uh, to help them. Now, the, one of the cool things about, about the tithe also, though, is that the people giving the tithe are partakers of the tithe. When, when you know, if it's your, you know, if it's that time of year, whatever, you're going down to bring your tithes, you go and you bring your stuff, but then you also like have a meal and eat and partake of it with the Levites, with the fathers, with the wisdom. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, did I turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 26? I like that aspect of it too because you're not only giving, you're seeing where everything you're giving is going to and what you're supporting and the, and the people you're, you're immediately affecting by going and bringing it in and, and being able to sit down and, and feel like you're actually giving and supporting a, a servant of the Lord, someone who's doing God's service. You sit down, you make the meal with them and, and do all that. And it's, it's a great system. Look at verse number uh, 1, Deuteronomy chapter 26. The Bible says, And it shall be when thou art come in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance and possessest it and dwellest therein, that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt put it in a basket, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. Jump down to verse number 9. The Bible says, And he hath brought us into this place, and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing, which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee and unto thine house, thou and the Levite and the stranger which is among him. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hast given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. I think I'm out of order here. Let me get there real quick myself. And keep note of that last verse there, verse number 12. Because this is also going to come up in the New Testament before we get there. I'm going to get to the New Testament more near the end of the sermon. But I'm going to reread verse number 12. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hast given it unto the Levite, the stranger, so a stranger is just a foreigner, the fatherless and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house and also have given them unto the Levite and unto the stranger, to the fatherless and to the widow, according to all thy commandments which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandments, 
neither have I forgotten them. This is a commandment of the Lord to give the tithe. This is something that belongs to the Lord. It's the way that God's going to take care of the people that are working and serving him. And it's also a way not just to serve those that are, that are working and serving him, but it also takes care of those who are genuinely in need. Like the stranger, the foreigner that's, that's you know, traveling or, or sojourning in the land, the, the fatherless, someone who's, who's, you know, maybe tragedy is struck at home or through no fault of their own. I mean, children that are born, you know, from out of wedlock or whatever, so, someone needs to take care of these people. Widows, their husband dies, their husband's bringing, you know, doing all the work and supporting her as, as, as he ought to be. Something happens, he dies. People need to be taken care of. So there are people in society that need a little bit of help. They need to be taken care of. And God makes provision for these people. And notice, it's through church, essentially. It's going to be through ministry. And, and if they're bringing their tithe to the place where the people are doing the work for the Lord, then guess what? Those other people who are in need, they're going to be need to be hanging around the Levites. Because they're not just bringing it to the homeless shelter. They're not bringing it to some other tribe. Well, we really like it over here and all the vagrants and the bums are going to go over there and they're opening up a soup kitchen. That's not the way it works. They're going down by the people of God. And, and I bet you they'd probably be working with them as well, but they're going to be down there in order to receive of that food, of that meal. You know, I'm sick of the people that call, and I haven't gotten it here yet. We probably just haven't been around long enough and we're not in the phone book yet. Right? As soon as we get in the phone book, though, you start getting the calls from people that just call churches looking for money. Oh, man, I need, I need to pay my electric bill. Oh, I just got kicked out. I need to stay a place to stay. I need this. I need that. Need, 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 need. And they call on the phone, and they're not even willing to get their rear end down here to church to sit through one service. All they care about is getting their stinking money. Well, you know what? Money is not going to solve your problems. And that's a whole completely different thing. It has nothing to do with tithing. Well, it does have something to do with tithing because... These people who are being cared for are actually people who are going to be going and being around God's people. You know, I really don't have a problem. I, I'll help people out. I will. I've helped people out in the past and I'll do in the future. If they're willing to come down, if they're willing to hear preaching, if they're willing to actually hear something that will do a difference in their life, because just giving somebody money that has all these problems, you aren't helping them at all. They think their problem is, oh, I just need to get through this week. I just need to get through this night. I just need a place to stay. No, you need to get the sin out of your life and stop creating all these problems for yourself. You don't have a financial problem. You have a spiritual problem. You need to get right with God. You wouldn't be begging bread if you were right with God. I know that much. And that's why I don't have a problem helping people out when they're going to come and receive something that's actually going to benefit them. And then in the meantime, help them get on their feet if they're willing to come and grow and listen and, and get right with God. You don't get right with God. Nothing I do for you is going to help you at all. And actually, if you don't want to get right with God, I don't want to be, you know, aiding and abetting someone who God might be cursing because he's trying to get your attention, trying to get you right with him. So we see here these, um, these things going on. We're on, uh, jump down to verse number, don't know, jump, flip over to chapter 14, Deuteronomy chapter 14. So we see some of the purposes for the tithe. And as we're going to see here in Deuteronomy chapter 14 is that the tithe is based on your increase. It's not on the gross, it's on the net. It's on, it's on you know, how you've been actually increased. So anyone, like if you own a business, you know all about this. There's expenses that go into operating a business, right? So your increase isn't going to be just like say, so let's say you have a business where you manufacture something, some clothing or whatever, and you sell it, right? Your total sales 
say it's $1,000, right? But you had to buy the shirts, you had to buy the equipment, you had to buy the dyes, you had to, you know, like, you just have to buy raw materials and things like that. So that cost you a couple hundred bucks, whatever. Your increase would be then $800. While well, you're subtracting off those costs, that's your increase. That's what you've actually benefited by. Same thing with, you know, even if it's with animals or whatever, you, gotta, you have to have food in order to feed them. You have to have other stuff. So it, it actually costs you money to, to have these things. But overall, you've got a much bigger increase. We, we breed dogs. We have puppies. That's an increase. When we have a litter of puppies, we're going to sell those puppies. We're going to make money off of that. But we need to consider that we're feeding those dogs. We're bringing them to the vet. We're doing, you know, we got all these other things that, that go along with the cost of doing that type of a business. So what God is expecting out of you is the tithe of the increase, what you've actually increased by. Now, that being said, there's other situations where... Um, God gets the first fruits. So we've seen the, the principle of God getting the first fruits and that belongs to God or that, you know, they bring the first fruits unto the Levites. When it comes to a paycheck, I believe it's right to tithe on the gross because that's what you actually have increased and in, in earned. Even if the government comes and they want to get their hands in there first. Just because someone else takes your money from you, I don't believe that they deserve that before God deserves his, his cut, right? His 10%. I don't think the government should be stealing from anybody. Now, they have supposedly the authority to do that or whatever. And either way, it happens. Whether they have the authority or not, that's what happens. That's not the same as a legitimate, you know, cost of business type of thing that's, that's causing you not to increase. Now, you may disagree with me on that, but I'm telling you, this is the way that I understand it, and this is the way that, that, that I do it. I, pray, I, I tithe personally, okay? And I don't keep any secret about that either. Whatever, I, whatever money I make, this is the way that I view things. I also believe that, and we're going to see, we're going to read this chapter in just a second, but when we're talking about an increase... When I receive or if I receive benefits where my employer is paying into me having some extra benefits or paying into a 401k or paying into something like that, I also tithe on that because it's, it's basically more compensation, things that I'm earning. So I'm going to look at that as an increase. I'm, I'm benefiting and getting this extra increase. There's more money being paid. Even if it's not being paid directly to me, it's being paid to something that's, that's benefiting me. So I will take all of that money when I consider in what it is that belongs to God and give him the tithe. Now we're going to see the increase here in, in Deuteronomy 14, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil. And the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, thou mayest, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose." And basically, then you get to partake of it there. But he's, he's saying that, um, you know, first of all, you need to tithe of the increase. But second of all, you need to go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And I firmly believe this as well when it comes to tithing is that you ought to bring your tithes to church. I think you ought to bring it there. I don't think you should just be sending your tithes in, especially to other churches. And I've always taught this and, and will preach this. We receive money. We have a donation uh, link up on the website for anyone who wants to donate to our church. And we'll have that. And there's nothing wrong with that. If anyone wants to give an offering unto our church, and I'm not talking about our church members here. I mean, your church members too, but we have people that, that want to support what we're doing that live in other places. So the easiest thing for them to do is, is send it through PayPal or whatever. And that's great. And then thank God for them. We have a lot of generous people out there that, that do donate to our church because they like what we're doing. 
They want to help support the ministry. They want to help buy Bibles. They want to help do whatever. And that's awesome. And we appreciate that. But when it comes to actually tithing, I think you need to be bringing your tithe to church and bring it to the church that you attend. I've always told people, look, if, if you want to tithe, but you're going to some other church, don't tithe to our church. Tithe to the church that you're attending. And if you have such a serious problem with that church that you're just like, well, I don't feel comfortable even giving them my money because they're going to use it for this or that, then you probably shouldn't even be there in the first place if it's really that bad, right? If you can't even trust them to like use your money for anything as a do for the Lord or even just to help the pastor or whatever, like, like what are you even doing there then? But if you're going to their church service, you're listening to the teaching of that pastor, you're listening to everything they're doing, support that church. That's your church. Get your heart in that church. You know, where, where your heart is, there shall your treasure be also. And if your heart's in that church, then give to that church. They're providing for you. They're giving you a service. They're offering teaching. They're offering things to you. Support it. That church. But, do you know, go to the place where you think, you know, God shall choose. But that's where he wants you to go, not for you to send your money. He says, you go unto the place that the Lord shall choose. Not just send your, your tithe to the place. He wants you to go. Don't just ship off your tithe in, with a shipping company. Now, if you, and, and don't get me wrong on this too, either because I think you should bring your tithe, but like if you show up to church all the time and you choose to donate, you know, to, to give your tithe on, uh, you know, using an online payment, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's wrong. Like you're, you're not bringing your tithe somehow to church. So d don't, don't take that the wrong way. I don't want you to, to misunderstand what I'm saying. However, however, I will make mention of this because I think some people don't think about this either is you want to make sure that God gets the full amount because when you give money online, unfortunately, it costs money. It's actually a service fee that, that needs to be paid so that the church doesn't actually receive the full amount of whatever you give. So that's an aspect that I think some people don't always consider either that now we, we pay those fees because again, it's, you know, if people are going to give money, great you know, we'll accept it, but we don't actually receive the full amount of whatever is given because, you know, whoever's processing our payment needs to, you know, make some money also. So just keep that in mind if you do online giving. Now jump down here. Let's keep reading here in Deuteronomy 14. Look at verse number 26. The Bible says, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household, and the Levite that is within thy gates. Thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. So here we see then a promise, which is also very common in a lot of these passages talking about the tithe, is that God will bless you. When you just are obedient, when you just do what God's telling you to do, when you bring your tithe, when, when you know, you're just following God's law, he says, I'll bless you for that. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 3, because tithing requires you to trust God. One of the lessons learned from just paying your tithe to the Lord, giving what belongs to Him back to Him, is what it is. I mean, really, when you're thinking about it, it there should never be this thought of like, well, should I pay my tithe? Should I, do, you know, it's like, what, what are you really doing? is saying, well, should I just keep something that belongs to God? We just got done reading Joshua uh, chapter 7 with, with the story of Achan, where everything was supposed to be dedicated unto the Lord. That belonged to the Lord. The spoils of Jericho belonged unto God. And what did Achan do? He took some of that for himself. And the Bible says that he was stealing from God. Well, if we choose just to, to say, no... I need this money. God doesn't need my money. I need this money. So I'm not going to give God the tithe. 
you're stealing from God. And Malachi chapter 3 says that. We'll get to that in a little bit. But it, 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 that's, the Bible clearly says that too. You're, you're robbing God when you're not giving your tithe. And I'll reiterate this. I'm not saying this because I want your money. I'm saying this so that you can have the information because wouldn't you like to know if you were even accidentally stealing from the Lord? I know I'd want to know. I think it's really important. I think it's something that everybody needs to know, which is why we're even going over this. Because it is an important topic. And hopefully, I, I'm pretty sure everyone does, but hopefully everyone's just okay with this anyways. But we could just learn a little bit more tonight. Proverbs chapter 3. One of the things that tithing requires us to do is to trust in the Lord. I think that's especially true when you don't earn a lot of money. When people have limited income. Maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe you have other debts. Maybe you have a big family and you just don't really have a lot of money. And you go, oh man, you know, this 10%, like, whatever that, that dollar amount is, you're thinking like, oh, it'd be so much easier. I wouldn't be struggling so much if I just had that little bit extra. Just a little bit. And in some people's cases, humanly spink thinking, that might make sense. Just, just in the flesh, just humanly thinking, the, the, the wisdom of this world, for sure, is going to tell you, well, absolutely. You don't have enough money to be, you know, given to church, to be tithing. But this is one of those areas that God wants you to trust him. Just trust him. Because he'll make sure that you're okay. And in fact, I believe you'll be even way better off by just being obedient in what he says and not stealing from him than whatever you think you're going to benefit by not giving it to him, by not giving that tithe. And when we remember that God's all-powerful, <laughs> he can get his tithe however he wants to. Right? Whether you give it voluntarily or you end up paying it in medical expenses or vehicle expenses or whatever. And if it happens to be that way, you know, it's probably going to be a lot worse. Now, you may not always know when something like that is, is, is God chastising you, but I do, I do know what the Bible promises here. We're going to read some of this about honoring God and respecting God and giving him what belongs to him. Look at verse number five of Proverbs three. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Trust, rely on him and lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't trust your own wisdom. Just trust God and what he says. Verse number six, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths that's every way, all thy ways, even financially. Just trust in the Lord. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance. That's talking about your money, your things, what you own. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. It's coming from the book of wisdom. Verse 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. He's saying, if you do this, if you honor God, if you give God the first fruits, your barns will be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. God will bless you for your obedience. He will make sure that you are provided for and provided for abundantly. He will. It may not even make sense to you, but God will make sure that things will happen. That, that things will happen well for you and that you'll be blessed for it because you've stepped out in faith, especially if you're thinking, man, we can't even afford this. I don't know how we're going to survive. But if you just say, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm still going to just give what, what I owe to God, God will bless you for that. He'll see that and he'll bless you for that. Turn if you to Malachi chapter 3. I was just talking about this. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, so if you get to Matthew, you just go backwards to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. And starting in verse number 8, the Bible says, Will a man rob God? 
yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. So God's saying, you know, he's saying, is a man going to rob God? Like, are you that stupid? You're going to try to rob God? And they're like, no, of course not. We're, you know, we're going to rob you. How would we rob you? He said, well, you've robbed me. And they're like, how? How have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. You're not giving. You're not giving to me what, what belongs to me. Verse number nine, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. He's saying, if you just tithe, he's like, try me on this, prove me. Test me out on this, if you will. Just do it and see. And he's like, I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour you out a blessing. I'll make sure you're taken care of. And, and you know what? Even all the nations round about are going to see you and be like, wow, what a great land. What a great booming economy and, and country over there. When you're giving God the first fruits, when you're giving him what belongs to him, he'll bless you for that. Turn if you to second. Chronicles chapter 31. Now he also said that they're cursed when they're not giving. And, and think about this. Since the tithe is supposed to go to support the workers and the laborers for the Lord, when the people stop tithing and stop giving, ultimately what belongs to God but that is also the source of the people who are serving the Lord and doing the work for the Lord. What are they going to do? They have to do something. So what's going to suffer? Well, they're going to have to feed them and their families. So what they're going to have to end up doing is going out and finding some other means to be taken care of because no one's taken care of them. And what does that do? That detracts from the work of the Lord. And you can see how easily this is going to apply to the New Testament Instead of a Levite, you still have servants of the Lord. You still have people who are doing a work and a ministry of the Lord. And, they're, and that are dedicating their time trying to work. Doesn't it make sense to support that person? So that they can focus only on doing the things of the Lord instead of having to focus on, well, I got to support my family, so none of this is coming in. Well, I mean... What are we going to do? Well, the work of God is going to end up suffering and, and you're going to be losing ground because all the time can't be dedicated in that thing. Now, this is a whole other sermon altogether, but I, I wholeheartedly believe that pastors ought to be paid, that it, that it is something that, that they ought to be cared for and, and provided for by the church. There's not a problem with that. Again, that, that is a whole other thing, but that, is, that, that goes hand in hand with the tithing. Because if you're going to have a minister, if you're going to have someone that's going to be serving God and that's their full-time job, they're going to need to be taken care of. I mean, it only makes sense. I know when I was sitting in the pew, I wanted really bad for Pastor Anderson to be full-time because he wasn't for a long time until pretty much right before I left. And I remember thinking like, man, you know, uh, you know, I, of course I was giving and I'm pretty sure everyone was giving too, but it just, you know, this, the, when a church is smaller, it's harder to, to support somebody. But I just remember the mindset of just thinking like, wouldn't it be great if instead of him having to do all this other work, he can just be like, like all the time just doing more soul winning, more Bible study, more, you know, reaching people, just, just doing more to just increase and do that much work. I mean, that's awesome. And that is the mindset. That's the mindset that everybody should have when it comes to uh, a subject like this, like, hey, let's, let's, let's all pitch in together. Because the, the thinking is, and with God, you know, there's 12 tribes. If everyone gave one-tenth, you know, 10 other tribes give one-tenth, that's enough to support one full tribe. Does that make sense? And they had 12 tribes, and one of them needed to be provided for. So it actually gave, you know, out of the other 11 giving one-tenth, 
that actually gave in, in abundance. It gave them a little bit more. It actually provided a little bit above and beyond what was actually would have just been needed to support one full tribe. And, and, it, and it's perfect. And, and, you know, that'll make up for people who aren't giving and everything else that that'll, that'll help to, to kind of make sure all that works out. It's a really good system. Um, a few other things that apply just, again, with, with tithing and, and when it comes to just little details that you might think of or questions that have come up. I've had, well, this actually happened to me personally. Sometimes people will receive things like insurance money. And you'll say, well, that's an increase, right? I don't believe that to be true. I mean, what, what that is is just, usually when receiving insurance money, whether it be from a, a car wreck or that was what was in my case or whatever, they're just, what it is is that's like justice. You had, like in my case, I had a vehicle and I had a, a, a functioning wrist and the insurance company adjusted and compensated me for my losses because I ended up losing my vehicle so they had to give me money to replace that vehicle and then the, the loss of, of movement in my hand and the problems that that's going to probably give me in the future, I was compensated for that as well. Now, when I got the money, I was kind of thinking like, wow, like this is kind of a blessing for me to just have this, this money. But, you know, the value was actually given to cover damages that were done. So I don't believe that's something that needs to be tithed on. Because it's not an increase. It's, a, it's an even swap is what it's supposed to be. They're just giving you damages. They're doing that type of control. And also now when it comes to taxes, this is, this is an interesting one. And I want to make sure I'm very clear about this too because I've actually, I've studied this a lot and I've heard people say things and I totally disagree with this. Uh, first of all, I want to say I don't think there's any problem with anybody writing off their giving on their taxes. Now, I already mentioned earlier that the tithe should come before the government gets their hand in your paycheck. So if you're tithing off of what you earn, there's no more obligation to God on the tithe. You've done, you're good and you're square with God on that front, just completely. I've heard people say, well, if you put that under, whatever extra you get back then because you're, you're um, itemizing, you're giving, it's like you're stealing from God. No, the government isn't God, <laughs> okay? The government stole from me. If I'm getting back just some of that money that they took from me, I'm going to go try to get as much of that back as I can. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that and there's nothing against God or you, you're, you know, you're stealing from God. No, you're not. I gave God, I'm not getting that money back. I'm not getting my tithe back. I'm pursuing the money that was, they already had their hands in in my paycheck <laughs> before I ever got it. That's what I'm trying to get back. Me and God are square. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there too because some people get confused about this. And obviously when you want to do what's right, I think sometimes people will think that they have to do more and they will end up giving more because you don't want to be wrong with God. So obviously like I would never want to do anything that's, that I'm shortchanging God. Right. But it's important just to know what's right and wrong. And, and you don't have to feel obligated to pay over and above what what God's actually expecting and requiring. One other thing that I that I also tithe on, though, because the Bible talks about just your increase, your increase. You know, if I'm increased in other ways, like outside of my employment, like people give you a gift or something like that. I also tithe on that. Now, maybe not everybody would do that, but I look at that as something that, hey, God's blessed me, you know, with this person being in my life and they give me some nice gift. I'll take that into consideration and I'll also tithe on those things as well because it's done an increase to me. I will give on those. The same thing, it's similar to like the work benefits. Um, but anyways, let's continue on here. Second Chronicles chapter 31. I'm kind of throwing these things in here as we go through to, to hopefully lighten up a little bit of the, some of these passages because they're not always the easiest to go through. 
We're just going to look at verse number four because there's another purpose for tithing. And, it's also, and of course, it's to provide for those doing the work of the Lord. Second uh, Chronicles 31, verse number four, the Bible says, Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and of all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep, and the tithe of holy things, which are consecrated unto the Lord their God, and laid them by heaps. And it goes on and on how they basically just brought in all this stuff and then everything was great. And that is an encouragement to the Levites. That's the encouragement to the man of God who's sitting there going, man, because I'll tell you what, when you got to work a full-time job and you're trying to serve the Lord and you're trying to get everything done, it gets really stressful because you want to get everything done. But when you see, oh, wow, I'm actually being provided for, now I don't have to just have this extra added stress of doing all this other work. Well, praise God, now that's an encouragement. Awesome, cool, I could, I could just move full speed ahead and just, and just focus on serving God. That is a great encouragement to have, and we see that found here also in the Bible. Now, uh, if you would like, turn to Genesis 14, and you could also put a bookmark in Hebrews 7, because we're we'll going there. I'm trying to go a little bit quicker now to get through this. We're going to be transitioning and getting into all the New Testament. Okay, we, we got a pretty good, and you know, there's so much stuff on tithing and everything. We go on and on and on in the Old Testament. There's a lot of information there. But when we just understand some of the basic principles of the tithe, why it was instituted, what's it for, we'll see how it applies in the New Testament. But the reason why I'm turning to Genesis 14 is it's the very first mention of tithing. And Genesis 14 is before the Mosaic Law. So we've been reading in the Law of Moses. We've been reading in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, right? We've been reading these places where God ordained, hey, you need to pay this tithe, and it's to the Levites. Okay, this is during that time period where God had established the Levites to do the ministry of the Lord, to do that service. Well, that's not when a tithe was first introduced. The, the idea or the notion or the wisdom of giving to God the first fruits comes even before that law. Genesis 14 Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. That's talking about Abraham giving Melchizedek tithes of all. That was after uh, Abraham, Abram had that great victory in that battle, getting Lot back and all that stuff. And he comes back and he meets Melchizedek, who the Bible says is the king of Salem. He's the priest of the Most High God. So Abraham gives God the glory. He gives God the credit. And he gives God his due in blessing him so abundantly and getting this great victory. And he gives Melchizedek a tithe. Now, the reason why this is so important, I'll turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 7. This is, this is critical, this is key. Because the people who want to say that the tithe is done away with, the reason why they'll say that, one of the reasons is because there's no more Levitical priesthood, right? And the tithe is written in the Law of Moses, and it had to do with that Levitical priesthood. But you see, understanding who Melchizedek is and the order of Melchizedek is, is basically where the priesthood changed from. It changed, for, or changed to, it changed from Levitical priesthood to the order of Melchizedek. And, of course, I believe this is an Old Testament appearing of Jesus Christ. Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. We're going to see that in Hebrews 7. He's without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. I mean, that's talking about God. And since Melchizedek was receiving tithes of Abraham before the Mosaic Law, wouldn't it make sense for him to be receiving tithes in the New Testament system and order of Melchizedek that we're supposedly currently in right now? Look at verse number 1, Hebrews 7. The Bible says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, 
first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. So he's saying, you know, yeah, here the Levites are receiving tithes. The, really, the Levites were, were um, spawned by Abraham, right? They're the descendants of Abraham. And Abraham is given more respect as the patriarch of the tribe of Israel, of all the different tribes. Abraham gets, you know, even more respect. And what he's pointing out here is saying, well, look, Abraham had these promises. Abraham was blessed. And when someone gives a blessing, the one who's, who's giving the blessing, was it, what's the exact phrase they use here? The, the, the less is blessed of the better, right? Melchizedek was better than Abraham. And he blessed Abraham. So it's, it, for one, it's pointing out the, you know, how great Melchizedek is that even though you have this great patriarch Abraham, he's being blessed by Melchizedek and Abraham's paying, you know, showing respect and giving honor and giving tithe unto him. Whereas the, the, the fruit of Abraham's loins receives tithes in this world, Melchizedek receives them um, of whom is witness that he liveth. Verse number nine, and as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. So even Levi is paying tithes to Melchizedek. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So people turn to that verse and say, oh, the priesthood being changed is made of necessity a change of the law. And they'll say, see, the tithe was under the Levitical priesthood, so no more tithe today. And I say, no. Because what was the priesthood changed from is changed from Levi. What was it changed to? Melchizedek. Did, does Melchizedek receive tithes? You better believe he does. So why would, why would we not pay tithes to Melchizedek today? Abraham did. Not only that, we see all the reason for the tithe of the Old Testament. Is there no longer a need? for people to do the service of the Lord and be provided for to do that work and to do that ministry? Is there no longer a need for that? I think there's still a need. Is there no longer a need for the widows and the fatherless to, to be cared for by God's people? Still a need. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we'll see this all now in the New Testament. Once you understand the principles and once we see this, now it's going to be very clear in the New Testament that all of these things that none of these things have really changed that need to be done, that need to be administered, that need to be happening in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Verse number 3, the Bible says, Honor widows that are widows indeed. Now that word honor, and I, and I bring this up almost every single time I preach on this at all, on anything that has to do with honor, honor isn't just talking about giving some type of, of recognition or respect like in a cognitive manner, manner. Honor, by and large, is referring to caring for and, and you know, supporting financially or giving things to. That's what honor really is. So when the Bible talks about honoring your father and mother, and if, you, if you're familiar with the Bible, you remember this passage where Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees for breaking the commandment of God when they said... Here's, here's what the Pharisees would do. They would say to their own father, you know, you just treat it as a gift, whatever you might be benefited by me. 
And they called that korban, or a gift, the Bible says. That's the way they dealt with their, with their father. Jesus rebuked them for not, for not honoring their father and mother. Because what they were doing is saying, well, hey, you just be thankful for anything that I give you, and you just receive that as a gift. And Jesus is saying, no, the Bible says that you are under obligation to take care of your parents. When the Bible says to honor your father and mother, it's talking about caring for them and providing for them because they provided for you when you were young. And you are under obligation to make sure your parents are provided for. You don't just leave them off in the street. You don't just say, well, I'll help you out a little bit here and there and just whatever I give you, you just better be thankful for, Dad. That's wicked. And the Bible says, honor your father and mother. You take care of them until they die. That's what it's talking about. And that honor is that type of, of, of prov provision. So when the Bible's talking about here, and, and this becomes clear in the chapter anyways, I don't need to tell you all that to even see that that's what it's talking about here. When the Bible says honor widows that are widows indeed, it's not saying hold the door open for them and say yes ma'am and, and respect them in that way. It's talking about widows that need help because they have nobody to provide for them. And this chapter, when you read this whole chapter, it makes that very clear because it defines who is a widow indeed. It gives you an age requirement. It gives you a, a spiritual application of, of, of what are they doing in the service of God? Are, are, do they have a good report? Are they actually you know, involved in ministry? Are they actually helping people out? Are they actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? Or are they just off living in sin? It gives you all of these qualifications in order to honor the widows that are widows indeed. And honor means support them. Jump down to verse number 16. In the same chapter, the Bible says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows... Let them relieve them, which is basically saying take care of them. Look, if you've got a widow in your family, you take care of them. The family is going to take care of them first. He says, and let not the church be charged. He said, don't make it the church's responsibility to care for your widows if you've got a widow in your family because that's a family matter. You take care of your family. It says that it, talking about the church, may relieve them that are widows indeed. Why? Because the church already has an obligation and responsibility to the widows who are widows indeed. And the church ought to be taking care of those widows. But anyone else that has family, that you have nephews and nieces and everything else, look, they need to be taking care of them. And then in verse number 17, after it talks about these widows, it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And again, that doesn't just mean double respect. Like, yes, sir, yes, sir, you say the same thing twice or so. That's not double honor. Double honor is talking about financially or however, just taking care of them, making sure they're provided for. And if they're working real hard, you know what? They deserve even more. They deserve being well taken care for because they're working really hard in the word. Let the elders that rule well be kind of worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, he, 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 he even continues more. If you say, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor Burns, I think you're crazy. That's not what honor means. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. You can't get much more clear than that. The ox treading out the corn, he's saying, you can't muzzle the ox. Let him eat. What he, you know, he's doing all this work for you. At least let him eat. You've got a workhorse of a pastor, of an elder. Feed the guy, right? He's doing all this work for you. Make sure he's, he's taken care of. Make sure he's fed. That's what this passage is talking about. So if you have this teaching in the New Testament of widows being cared for, men of God doing ministry, being taken care of, given honor, where is it going to come from? We know where it came from in the Old Testament. It came from the tithe. And it was a great system. And it made sense. Where does it come from in the New Testament? The same place. Because it wasn't done away with. Because nowhere are you going to see the tithe is done away. Anywhere. Now, a few more passages just to answer some critics. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. And this is where I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't get in depth in the New Testament passages. So I will now. Where people will conflate 
two different things. So one of the, one of the passages that we're going to see here that, that people who, who disagree with tithing in the New Testament will point to a, a passage like this. 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 7, the Bible says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. People say, see, see, in the New Testament, it's not, you're not giving of necessity as in you have to, because in a tithe, what do you, you have to give 10%, right? So the point to this verse and if you don't read things in context, and if you're not reading the scripture and you're just going to accept what any, anyone says, you'll be like, oh, wow, oh, okay, well, yeah, I guess you see you have a point. Well, why don't we see what he's talking about first? I want someone to point out to me where it says he's talking about a tithe. Because you know what? It's not in this passage. Look at verse number one, and we'll actually read this in context. Because you know what? God does love a cheerful giver. First of all, I mean, this verse is, there's nothing incorrect about this verse. This verse is absolutely true. It's the word of God. But what's, he, what's it in reference to? Verse number one, for as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So what's going on here? Verse number one says, for us touching the ministering to the saints. There are other believers in another country that were not at Corinth that had a need. They had a financial need. And Paul's writing to him saying, hey, I know how great you guys are. You already got a reputation for helping people out. Why don't you help these people out? Just, just take a collection for the saints in advance. And that way, when we come, it's all ready to go and everything. You know, and he gives all these other reasons, but it's like, this is not talking about a tithe that belongs to God. He's talking about collecting money together to help support someone else. It would be as if, I said, hey, we're going to take a special collection for Pastor Robertson because his family is going through all this turmoil and they're having this legal battles and he's got all these expenses and their church is everybody there is in dire need because they're being persecuted. Hey, let's take up a collection here and we'll send it over there to be a blessing unto them. Do you have to give? Is that a commandment of God? No. That's why he says, not of necessity. And don't feel like you just have, he, he doesn't, what he's saying is, these people are in need. And it's a serious need and they could really use your help. But what I don't want you to do is to become bitter because you feel like you just have to give this money unto these people over there. He's saying, you know, if that's the case, then don't do it. God wants you to be happy about it, to just be a blessing and to help them out. And if it's going to cause you to be angry or mad about it or feel like you have to do it, you don't have to do it. Because that's not a tithe. You don't have to do it. It's just totally out of your own heart to help these people out. It makes perfect sense in the context. There's nothing to do with the tithe. Turn, if you would, to, um, we're almost done, Second, uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Yeah, I'll blow, I'm going to blow through this real quick. I am going to, I'm going to cut that part out. What they'll find in Matthew chapter 6 is people say, well, see, the Bible says, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So if you're giving a tithe, your left hand has to know what your right hand is doing because you're calculating 10% in order to give that to God. Right? But he's saying, just don't even, I mean, you're, you're just supposed to give and just whatever. 
And that's what people will teach. I've heard it before. That's why it's coming up now. But again, context is key. What is he talking about? Let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 6, teaching from Jesus Christ himself. Verse number 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. I'm sorry, where was the word tithe? When you tithe, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is. When you're tithe, do it in secret. Wait, is that what it says? Oh, wait, no, it says alms. You know why it says alms? Because an alms isn't tithe. It's not the same thing. The alms doesn't belong to God. The tithe does. It's a different way of giving. There's lots of ways to give. There's lots of purposes and reasons for giving. They're not all just called the tithe. An example of someone giving alms you don't have to turn it. It's found in Acts chapter 3, verse number 2. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So here's a guy that was lame. He was injured. He couldn't work. He needed help. So what's he doing? He's asking people for help. It's, he's panhandling. But he goes to church to do it. And he actually has a legitimate reason for not being able to work because he's lame of his feet. It's not like he's just a lazy bum and doesn't want to go out and get a job. He just, he's physically handicapped. So he goes to church to where he's thinking, hey, maybe I could find people here that's going to help me out. And he's asking for alms. Now, doesn't that make sense in the context where Jesus is saying, you know what? If you're going to help somebody out, don't make sure, hey, everybody, you know, this guy's approaching Peter and John. Did they go, oh, hey, here you go, buddy. $500 just for you. And you say it real loud and make sure like enough people can hear you. Be like, oh, wow, look how generous that guy is. That's what he's talking about. And he's saying, you know what? If you're going to be a blessing to someone, don't even think about the money, right? Like you're, you're giving it to them just to be a blessing. So in that regard, don't let your left hand know your right hand. Do it. It's not that big of a deal. Hey, just give it to him and bless him. That's alms. That makes perfect sense. But again, it's not the tithe. And all of these, whatever they come up with, you know, they're going to try to, and usually they'll, they'll go to verses like this, or they'll try to, to focus in just really hardcore on the tithe and how it was agriculture or how it was, be, you know, and, and they, they really try to get you twisted around just on, on focusing on that too much instead of what's the purpose of the tithe. They focus just so much on, on how is it carried? Well, is it every three years? Is it every year? Well, oh, you don't even know what the tithe is. And, you know, and, and it's, it's foolishness. It all makes sense. You compare it to the Old Testament and the New Testament. The purpose of it is to support the ministry of God. The ministry of God is supposed to be provided for, as we see in the New Testament clearly by Scripture. All giving is not the same. You run across people trying to tell you that, that, oh, no, we don't need to tie the New Testament. They're full of baloney. Like I said, I, I already cut a bunch of things out. There's so much more that you can talk about this subject. I feel like we don't need it, to be honest with you. I don't think we need any more. I think the point is made sufficiently. If you have a, if you, if you have a problem with it, if someone's turned your head around or whatever, and you're still not convinced about something, let me know. I'd be happy to answer any questions after service, but... Um, as I mentioned before, I don't, I, don't think this, I don't think anybody in our church has a problem with it anyways. Everyone's extremely generous. I think above and beyond even what God is requiring. But I just want to make sure that information's out there. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the teaching from your word, dear God. I pray that you would please just help us all to um, be strong in our doctrine, understand and know why we believe what we believe. Lord, we love you. We've got a heart to serve you. We just want to do things that are right. We don't want to be wrong and cross you in any way. Dear Lord, and um, help us just to, to have the proper guidance and wisdom so that we wouldn't even ignorantly um, do something that, that would not be right. Lord, give us that, that light and the guidance. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to make one more point. I just remembered this. If there's something 
that I didn't convince you of. Especially if it comes to one of those areas where I don't think you have to, you know, like I don't think you have to back, get back taxes or I don't think you have to do this or that, right? And you disagree with me on that. If you think you need to give more in your heart, even if you're wrong about that, if you think that, don't then not give because I, said, because I said it's wrong, right? So like the Bible says that if you believe something to be true, if you're not acting on faith, you know what I'm talking about? Am I making sense? If you're, if you're not acting on faith, on your conviction, on what you believe to be true, that's what God's going to look on that. Even if, even if you were incorrect about having to do it, if in your heart you feel like, no, man, I really got to do this, and you don't do it, then that is a sin. Okay, I just want to throw that out there because... Um, you know, I just want to make sure everybody's right with God all the way around.